suddenly doing something out of the Bible. It was just part of the, this big soup we were all swimming in. I mean, you had, okay, the Eleven Spoonful was popular, you know, the Mamas and Papas. There was a strong folk element, and I think it was understood by anyone who paused to think about it, was that folk borrows from tradition. And Rogers, a banjo player, Pete Seeger wrote the music. Well, that's what folk rock was supposed to be. You know, folk music electrified. So to take a Pete Seeger song, you know, the, the grandfather of authentic folk music, and, and electrify that, it's a great idea. Turn, Turn, Turn proved to be hugely successful in America. It elevated the band back to the peak of the charts, and they retained the number one spot for three consecutive weeks. Two number one singles within seven months confirmed the Bird's status as the preeminent young American rock band. This place was driven not because it was a music capital, not by uh, thoughts of fame or fortune. People didn't do that. It was not a con conscious thought, really, until the Bird's. Then we saw what that David Crosby looked good in a Porsche. You know, we saw there was something, there was some gain uh, at, at going commercial, being commercial, having a commercial success. People started to seeing that, and some of them entered that industry because of what the birds signified. And they, what they signified, I think, at the time, was a surgical kill. They got to be part of the industry, they served the industry, but they actually did it without and in any way reducing what their uh, political urgency dictated. And you couldn't go wrong with turn, turn, turn. It was biblical in origin, and it played in Peoria. Columbia hurried out Turn, 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 the album, just in time to catch the traditional Christmas retail boom. The record was a cautious advance from Tambourine Man, much the same sound, but with less reliance on the Dylan songbook. Again. The original material was largely supplied by Gene Clark. I think Turn, 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 it's a good record, but if you're a serious Birds fan and you're looking back on their history, it's a mildly disappointing record because the Mr. Tambourine album was so great. It was one of the rare albums from the mid-60s, aside from The Beatles and Bob Dylan, where every song was really good, I think. And there was a lot of diversity in the same record, even though there was a certain consistency to the sound. But on Turn, 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 it sounded like they were treading water to some degree. There weren't any songs on, or recordings on the album that were nearly as good, I think, as the Turn, Turn, Turn track or single itself. And when they were covering songs looking to outside material, the choices didn't seem as inspired as they had on Mr. Tambourine Man. And also the original material they were doing was not on, still on the same level as the songs they were covering. An example of a way in which their songwriting was growing, however, was the track Set You Free This Time, where Gene Clark's lyrics are starting to take a more mature, sophisticated, even a little bit of a strange tinge. conversational song in, in many respects you know the first thing that I heard you say when you sent it there that new way is that you were not blind so it's kind of he reflects it's, it's both reflective and there's a nobility at the song but there's also a tremendous bitterness in there he's both berating the girl but there's a there's, 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 there's an, a, a courtly love sense as well within that song a politeness and, and that was the tension within the song, and, and, and he always had that tension. I mean, I'll feel a whole lot better is very similar when he says, you know, I'll probably feel a whole lot better when you're gone. It's quite a vicious lyric, but you wouldn't get a sense of that. It also has a humanity to it um, because it's dealing with, with pain. And the one thing Gene Clark did well was pain. The 
getting into more of the full country backgrounds, which are obviously dear to their hearts to some degree. And if you're a big Birds fan and a Gene Clark fan, if you listen to that song today, I think there's some regret that's associated with that because Gene Clark left the band shortly after the second album. You kind of wonder, well, if Gene Clark had only been able to stay with the group for at least another album or two, maybe there would have been a bunch of songs like Set You Free where the lyrics as well as the music were evolving in a very personal way that the rest of the birds could still contribute to and they could all sound like a group. As it happened, there weren't many songs like that that Gene Clark was able to write within the birds' context. And that's a big loss, even though they made some brilliant records after he left. The Birds began 1966 rolling under the twin forces of great creativity and enormous consternation. Though they had been working on what would become one of their landmark recordings, Eight Miles High, the band suffered their first serious fracture as both producer Terry Melcher and major songwriter Gene Clark parted company with the group. Uh, there are a lot of factors contributing to why Gene left, and, and uh, but the point that you raise is really a good one, is what would have happened if he had stayed? You know, if you look at his body of music and if you, you look at... Uh, you look at the lyric content and the way that he put chords together, and, and like Chris Hillman is quoted as having said that he never saw Gene read a book, nor did I. He was not a reader, as far as any of us know. But he understood words on a, like, like an intuitive level, almost like somebody putting together pieces of tile, you know? And uh, the way that he wrote, like we'd be in a hotel room or something, and we'd have you know, our guitars. And he loved to physically write out the lyrics as we were composing like the way they looked on the page. He wrote in all capital letters. He had a certain reverence for the way that the lyrics, even before they were finished, the way they looked on the paper. So it was kind of, it was almost like this guy when he wasn't writing, right, was the last person in the world that you would expect could do that. And yet when he did it, it was like you realized, this is amazing. This is really amazing. And he, he had a... Uh, a way that he heard chords that was really uncommon. Obviously they lost those songs. There was a tremendous amount of conflict. Gene, Gene had a lot of sides to his personality. And the stories that I've heard, now I wasn't there for this part of the band, so I'm reticent to repeat things that I didn't personally witness. But what I've heard that he sort of became the whipping boy for David's frustration. And that, that um, David was cruel to Gene. Like I say, I didn't witness it. But they lost a great deal of conflict as well as musical potential when, when Gene left. There was something going on in that band that I think was painful for everyone. They'd also lost their producer, my goodness, apart from anything else. Not only they'd lost Gene Clark, they'd also lost Terry Melcher. Um, they fired him. One of the most stupid things they ever did. They fired Terry Melcher because he got drunk on the set and Crosby didn't like him anyway. Um, and McGuinn went along with it. Well, I was sorry to see uh, the birds and Terry take uh, different routes. It was like watching some people that you love who are married get get divorced and you know you don't know how to extend your your loyalties Terry was asked once to by a reporter to name the person I just as a, an afterthought to a, a documentary in which he appeared to name the uh, the most objectionable character he had ever met in music. And Terry, without missing a beat, said, that would have to be David Crosby. And the reporter, I think rather embarrassed that he'd asked the question, he said quickly, well, who's the second most objectionable person you've met in the music business? Terry said, no problem there, Charles Manson. It didn't go down very well with the hierarchy at CBS, but of course neither did the leaving of Gene Clark, and those two things happened pretty well, you know, 
within weeks of each other. There wasn't, there wasn't much time between Melcher leaving and Clark leaving. It just, you know, two very important units in the whole story just, just, just gone. And dispensed with, with a certain carelessness. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing looking back. It, again, the insouciance of the birds is, is incredible, you know. Did they beg Gene Clark to come back and tell him that it would be a mistake? No, they just, just accepted it. Okay, ah, well, you know, you know, they were very philosophical about it. Melcher goes, oh, we'll just get another producer. <sighs> that man on the end is Jim McGuinn. The one playing bass is Chris Hillman. The one playing drums is Michael Clark. And I'm David Crosby. And when we are together, uh, they call us the birds. Despite the upheavals surrounding the band, the Birds, and in particular David Crosby, were beginning to push the frontiers of their sound. Recent live performances suggested that the band were moving into a more left-field sonic territory of complex, jazz-infused rock. You've got Crosby, this adventurous musical soul, listening to music far outside the box of rock and roll and then pushing this stuff on the rest of the band. So there's this famous story, you know, on tour in America in 1965 on the tour bus. Crosby's got this, this tape that's got uh, John Coltrane on one side and Ravi Shankar on the other side and he's playing it endlessly. Uh, and um, this all then emerges really as Eight Miles High. Um, one of certainly one of the first records that you'd you, you, you'd categorise as uh, uh, psychedelia. <laughs> I think Eight Miles High was a vastly important song, both to the Bird's career and to mid-1960s rock. I do think it's the first song to really effectively blend a lot of the elements that we think of as core to psychedelic rock. And that is combining folk rock and Beatles-type rock with some 